Good afternoon and welcome to the January 22nd, 2018 meeting of the Orlando City Council. Wow, we've got a pretty full house of, uh, looks like happy, nice people. <laughs> Not a whole lot of people with angry expressions or anything. Must be good new year and everybody's happy that it's warming up just a hair except for in council chambers where it's freezing cold. <laughs> but we have enough people in here to provide a little body heat, I guess. All right, we're going to begin today's proceedings with the invocation offered by an Osceola cowboy today. That's, mm -hmm. How about that? Got to get some cowboys in here. Um, Nick Shanine is an attorney and mediator here in Orlando, and he was, in fact, like I, raised in Kissimmee and graduated from Osceola High School. He received his undergrad in political science and sociology from Rice University in Houston and his JD with honors from the University of Florida. He is a member of the West Orange Habitat for Humanity and Legal Aid Society of Orange County and has served as a guardian of an item for over 50 children during his career. He lives in West Orange County with his wife Carol, who's a teacher of American government at Olympia High School, and their two children, Jake and Anna. Um, their family enjoys scouting, soccer, and traveling to Gainesville for Jim Gator games. Yes. Okay, after the invocation, we'll be led in the pledge by Commissioner Tony Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor Dyer. Uh, that uh, last time I was given the honor of doing the invocation, uh, the great clerk, Alana Brenner, had asked me to come, and I uh, gave a prayer from Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, so I'm going to stick with uh, presidential uh, types of uh, prayers and go with one from John F. Kennedy from his 1963 Thanksgiving address. Let us proclaim our gratitude to Providence for manifold blessings. Let us be humbly thankful for inherited ideals. And let us resolve to share those blessings and those ideals with our fellow human beings throughout the world. On this day, let us gather in buildings dedicated to public service and in our homes blessed by family affection to express our gratitude for the glorious gifts bestowed upon us. And let us earnestly and humbly pray that our Creator continue to guide and sustain us in the great unfinished tasks of achieving peace, justice, and understanding among all men and nations and of enduring, ending misery and suffering wherever they may exist. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Madam Clerk, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Could you call the roll to make a determination of quorum, please? Commissioner Gray? Here. Commissioner Ortiz? Here. Commissioner Stewart? Here. Commissioner Sheehan? Here. Commissioner Hill? Here. Commissioner Ings? Here. Mayor Dyer? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum with all members present. Thank you, Madam Clerk. First order of business is consideration of minutes from the agenda review and city council meetings of January the 8th. Uh, motion by Commissioner Ortiz, second by Commissioner Sheehan. On favor of the motion, indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? So the motion carries. All right, let's do some awards and presentations. Uh, we have two today, and we're going to start with uh, Brenda March introducing an award from the Steinway Society of Central Florida. Brenda? Mm. Right in there. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Commissioners. It is my distinct pleasure to present to you Kathy and Gary Grimes. They are the owners of the Steinway Galleries of Central Florida, as well as the Steinway Board of Directors. Kathy and Gary Grimes, to date, through grants, donations, and annual diva concerts, 100 pianos have been donated to children. Steinway Society of Central Florida, board members are here today. Can you please stand and be recognized? As well as the, as well as the partnering organizations, the church, 
and those that are the great recipients of this wonderful program in the city of Orlando. <laughs> Mayor, I would like to ask Kathy and Gary Grimes to come forward to talk about this wonderful program that they donated to the city of Orlando and has expanded. It started out in PKC as a partner and then went over to District 6. And so I just want to tell you again, thank you so much. They have been wonderful uh, partners for Paramour Kids Zone. And I'm so fortunate to have them here with us today. Thank you, Brenda. Welcome, Gary. Kathy, thank you, thank you for everything you guys do. Well, our real reason is to uh, be here today is to honor you mm. uh, because <laughs> recognize this. I do. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the picture, though. It uh, changed a little bit in 12, <laughs> 12 years. But uh, really, uh, your program inspired us to get involved in the Paramore Kids Zone. And uh, you introduced us to uh, Brenda March, bless her heart, and she introduced us to uh, some wonderful people here in Paramore. Uh, we got started with our program at Shiloh, and uh, we've been there for about 12 years now. <clears throat> and we followed with Callahan, Smith Center, uh, the uh, New Age, and our final program, we were encouraged by Commissioner Inks to go to Frontline. And we were introduced to uh, a smoking piano player, Pastor <laughs> <laughs> <After> Bruce. <laughs> So uh, it's special thanks to you and a special thanks to uh, Commissioner Hill and Ings uh, for your inspiration in this program. And we have a plaque for you that Kathy would like to, uh, to read, if we may. <clears throat> in grateful appreciation to Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer, who provided the Steinway Society with inspiration through the Paramore Kids Zone for the Steinway Piano for Kids program, we hereby name you an honorary lifetime member of the Steinway Society of Central Florida. Signed, Kathy and Gary Grimes, founders and the Steinway Society Board. All right, well, thank you. And because of this, we've given thousands of piano lessons mm -hmm. and over 100 pianos uh, to kids in the Paramore Kids Zone. So thank That's you. Right. <clears throat> I can assure you that I am the least musically inclined member of the Steinway Society. <laughs> <laughs> I can listen to music. Another uh, presentation relates to our um, ISO rating with our Orlando Fire Department, so I'm going to call on Chief Williams. Chief? All right, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commission. I am standing before you, I'm proud to announce that um, the Atlanta Fire Department has retained our ISO rating, one rating for the 10th consecutive year, um, that, which makes us one of the best fire departments in the country. We're in the top half percent of 44,000 fire departments in the country. So it would not be... <laughs> a 
again, it would not be possible without your leadership, Mayor, and the Commission, uh, CEO's office, and the men and women of Atlanta Fire Department, both uh, civilian and sworn. If they, they are constantly giving of themselves to make this community safe, and this award um, signifies how safe the city of Orlando is compared to other fire departments across the country. And standing to the right of me is Tom Weber from the ISO to give a little more background. Tom. Great. Thank you for being here, Mr. Weber. Thank you, Mayor, C uh, City Commissioners. Uh, my name is Tom Weber. I'm from Florida. I'm the National Director for ISO's Community Hazard Mitigation Program. And I'm absolutely honored to be here today to present you with your continuing class one. Ten years is a major accomplishment, and I want to congratulate the city on ten years of being an ISO class one. Thank you. Let me tell you real quick a little bit about it. It is a community grading. It's not just the fire department. We look at the entire community because we rate your risk. We look at your water department, your communications, and your community risk reduction. And we know for a fact through our actuaries that a better ISO grade is better fire protection. This grade packet includes uh, a total of 105.5 points. And I'm just going to run through your scores real quick. You've gotten uh, a 10 out of 10 in communications, 43 out of 50 in the fire department, 38 out of 40 in the water department, and 4.97 out of 5.50 for your community risk reduction for a total score of 93.83 out of 105 points. That's a very good score. <laughs> Finally, I want to let you know how important that class one is. There's, there's 46,000 fire protection districts that we grade and like the chief said, there's only a half percent that are class one. There's uh, your one in 300 class ones throughout the entire country. You're one in 30 class ones in the state of Florida, but even more importantly, you're one of 46 fire departments in this country that are both accredited and a class one, which is a true example of professionalism when it comes to providing of emergency services. Thank you for this opportunity again, and Mayor, I have your report for you. Hey, Mayor, just real quick, I know we didn't say, uh, thank the staff, but April Taylor, could you still stand up, please? April is, is I want to say, the project manager that constantly um, giving of herself to make sure we remain um, ISO 1 as well as accredited. So, April, thank you and your entire staff. At agenda review today, uh, the council agreed that we would move one of the items on our agenda up ahead of the mayor's update and the consent agenda, and that's uh, new business number one, which is a real estate donation. And I want to thank the council for allowing us to do that. Um, we certainly, one of the things we hold high and dear is arts and our arts experience in our downtown and our various cultural opportunity so today on the agenda we have a donation agreement for the historic Rogers building to the city of Orlando and we will continue to use that space as a cultural facility and with us today is the owner of that property Ford Keeney um, and I would say Ford is one of the great patrons of the arts in downtown Orlando and has had a tremendous impact on many aspects of the life of our community from sports to beer to uh, <laughs> the cultural aspects and he acquired the Rogers building which we're now going to refer to as the Rogers Keeney building in um, 
1999 and restored it and I hope everybody's had an opportunity to be in for an art show or just to have a cup of coffee but we will have a celebration next week on the 31st um, to honor the donation but I'm pretty excited about accepting this on behalf of the city it's a beautiful building and Ford thank you for entrusting us here at the city with a great cultural gem that you have created thank you so much So before I come down and do a picture, how about if we actually vote on this? Is there a motion? So moved, second. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Sheehan. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. I'm going to move right into the mayor's update. So one of the additional great things about Orlando, we just celebrated the um, donation of the Rogers Keeney building, but we have so many great events in our downtown. Uh, I was actually at a couple of concerts this weekend. We just finished the bowl season with three great, great bowl games, and coming up now is the 2018 NFL Pro Bowl, which returns to Camping World Stadium in just a few days this coming Sunday. So there are a series of Pro Bowl Week events going on, free interactive fan experiences, youth and high school football competitions, and a series of community events. And then the culmination is 88 of the NFL's best players uh, accepting out any Patriots or Eagles, I guess, on Sunday, this coming Sunday at 3 o'clock, and there are tickets that are still available. Um, join me for one of my favorite events of the year, which is the Neighborhood and Community Summit on Saturday, February 10th at the Lowe's Royal Pacific Resort. Residents and community leaders come together to learn, share, and network, and we will have great exhibits, great um, workshops, um, you have until the 7th to sign up, cityoforlando.net, and we have a great keynote speaker, and our poet laureate will be there, and we'll recognize our champion and community builder awards. Okay, some exciting stuff on the agenda. I want to highlight three of them. 
Um, the first is a uh, continuation of our sustainability efforts. Last year, we committed to utilize 100% renewable energy for municipal operations by 2030 and citywide by 2050. On today's agenda is an agreement with the Solar Energy Innovation Network for a grant to help us develop a roadmap to do exactly that. Uh, the grant allows our Greenworks Orlando team to work with OUC, Green, the Green Link, Green Link Group, and UCF's Florida Solar Energy Center to analyze OUC's power generation and identify the potential for solar energy at City of Orlando facilities. All right, one that uh, I think the rest of the people that are here smiling today are here is uh, an agreement with the Holocaust Center to build a cultural destination in downtown Orlando and it will be absolutely more than just a destination. I think it's a perfect fit for our downtown. The mission of the Holocaust Center aligns um, almost perfectly with our efforts to be an inclusive city that embraces diversity, promotes equality and respect for everyone. Lando will continue to send a powerful message to the world as we continue to honor history and ignite hope. So I know that a number of the Holocaust board members are here today. If you would please stand and let us thank you for your efforts to make hate history. And we are proud to be a partner with you guys on this journey. Last item that I want to highlight is um, an item that uh, furthers our efforts to ensure that we have transportation and recreational opportunities for our residents and visitors. And thanks to DOT, we have grant funding to move forward design on two bike and pedestrian projects that are key to our urban trails. One is to extend Gertrude's Walk South and then the other is that gap between the Dinky Line Trail and our new Colonial Overpass so that we can complete that piece that's coming in from the north. And one day we're gonna have one of the best systems of trails uh, that there is in Florida. So that is also on the agenda. With that, we will uh, move on to the consent agenda. And the consent agenda is a number of items that are acted upon through a single vote of council we give each of our commissioners an opportunity to comment on the items on consent as well as update you on important happenings from their district we rotate the order that we do that and today commissioner ortiz is first up thank you mayor well let me start by saying that this past saturday i must have had the greatest experience in many many years 12 years to be exact i had not ridden a bicycle a motorcycle in a long time and we had this ride for Veterans, we're raising money for a couple of veterans. We had this ride from Sanford to Ace Cafe. And what a ride that was. Over 1,000 motorcycles came from Sanford. And uh, I've never seen so much camaraderie among veterans. Everybody came together, the place was packed, but everything was done in an orderly fashion. No incident, it was a lot of fun, and uh, we need to keep on doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to keep getting people involved. So kudos to a good friend, Sergeant Andres Burgos. He also works with OUC, the reliable and sustainable one. His father, his family, and all the organizers. Um, Mayor from Sanford was there, and uh, he, he did some writing for a while also. People from all walks of life came over. I put a jacket, I looked like a biker for the first time in my life. Uh, so it was... <laughs> It was a little different. Uh, there's a few pictures going around, so. Anyhow, uh, don't hold that against me. I had a lot of fun. Uh, on January the 18th, I had the honor of being inducted as a second vice president with the Florida League of Cities. I'm really looking forward to work with these folks again on uh, the Tri-County Tri League of Cities. We have a lot going on. And along that, the Tri-County League of Cities is also helping the Florida League of Cities with our home rule issue has become municipalities uh, really striving to get this home rule uh, back in our municipalities. We need, we need the respect from Tallahassee. Tallahassee needs to realize that it's not about them over there legislating, it's about the people here deciding what they need for their communities. And, and we need to stop this nonsense going on in Tallahassee. We need to recoup our power back as a community. Um, Additionally, I want to thank our Dover Manor 
Homeowners Association for allowing me to speak at their first meeting of the year. I was able to give important updates from our district and uh, giving them a heads up on what's coming, uh, coming up this year. I'd like to also invite all of you this Saturday, January 27th, to Lake Eola as we march in company of Weeping Childhood Cancer uh, in order to bring awareness to the lack of funds for research for childhood cancer. Only 4% of the monies um, collected go to childhood cancer. We need to do better than that. There's a lot of children out there that are being affected by this horrible disease. So we need to not only create conscience about this, but getting involved. We never know how, where, and, and when this is going to affect us or is going to affect a family member. So uh, in terms of the agenda, I'm voting no on item hearings ordinance first read. Uh, in terms of uh, congratulations to our sustainable team, Chris Castro, and our city staff on, on that solar energy innovation grant from the U.S. Department of Energy. That's great news. Um, can't say enough about the uh, MOU with the Holocaust. You guys are awesome. Very proud. When I heard the news, I was really excited. They didn't have to say much. I said, I'm on board. Um, this is neat. You guys are doing a great job. Uh, not only helping our kids, but I think there's a lot of information that has to be disseminated. And you guys are also the foundation to help other groups that are trying to rise in terms of equality and, 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 and opportunities. And we need to keep uh, disseminating that message and we need to keep working together. So thank you so much for that. And last but not least, and he left, um, is our good friend, Mr. Fort King. His legacy is just on parallel what he has done for the city through the years and uh, what he keeps doing. And this last gift is, is, or this gift that we just received today is, I mean, there's no way of describing uh, his legacy. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. Before I move on to Commissioner Stewart, now that some of the uh, audience has cleared out, I recognize that there are a lot of people that are younger than most of us in the audience, which leads me to believe we have a number of students that are in attendance. So if you are a student and you're in attendance to observe the city council meeting, could you please stand? Oh, cool. All right. Is everybody from Valencia? All right. Cool. Okay. All the same class? <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for being here. and. Uh, we appreciate you coming to learn about our government and how local government especially works. Okay, Commissioner Stewart. Hey, thank you, Mayor. And let me uh, also say uh, a couple, couple of comments about the agenda. I'll get to that in just a moment. But here's some quick updates. Um, there are those who have been asking about what's going on with the Green Drive study and the Metro Plan study they've been doing. Uh, I want to make sure that we have plenty of input. Uh, there are six conceptual variations, and they we're looking for the last stage of community input. So please get involved. Um, there's the first of six pop-up meetings, um, pop tabletop meetings, over at the Audubon Park Community Market tonight from 5 to 9. And you can also go to the website and check it out, and you can get to that through us. Um, a special event is coming up on February 10th. <clears throat> it will mark the 50th anniversary of the passing of uh, Mitchell Nutter. Some of you may, re may remember that name. Mitchell Nutter Park is over in our area and the community has wanted to do something for a while and to uh, honor him and, uh, and the loss of Atlanta Patrolman Mitchell Nutter that was killed in the line of duty. Um, so on one o'clock that afternoon we're going to have some uh, uh, a chance to commemorate his life to recognize the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the park there and we've got a couple things to clean it up and get ready for it and as well as uh, his uh, uh, grand or his daughter and grandchildren will be attending as well. So we are excited about the chance of recognizing him and memorializing him uh, uh, in, in this way. Uh, the Indy Folk Festival at the Manello Museum is coming up. It's an annual family and pet friendly event. It takes place on February 10th from 12 to 5. So those can go to the Mayor Summit, come to mine, and then come <laughs> over there. It'll be a whole day of great city activities. So we're bringing together the community again for local, national, and regional art, uh, as well as music and culinary talent. So, 
And if you haven't driven by Baldwin Park lately, you may see some construction over there. We're excited on the construction of our first fitness pod in Baldwin Park. Uh, it's a wide vari variety of uh, exercise equipment, uh, push-up bars, parallel bars, um, and we're using it, uh, placing it over in the center of the park. We're excited about that as another um, uh, way to make our city more healthy, and I appreciate the staff working with us to make sure that happens. Uh, on the uh, agenda today, let me just say thank you to uh, our Orlando Fire Department. ISO rating one is a big, big deal. And when you add to it the, the uh, certification as well as ISO one rating, it is, um, um, uh, we're very honored uh, to the work that they do. Um, and I know sometimes we get crossways, but I want to tell you there's been nobody who has not devoted, uh, has not been committed to their devotion to making our city safe. And I want to tell you how much I appreciate them. And Chief, if you're around, I think he's stepped out for a few minutes, but Chief, if you're around, please pass that along to them. And last, I want to mention A2, the Holocaust Center. The Holocaust Center's influence in our community is truly multifaceted. Um, they've had an incredible impact on our community, especially in our schools, especially in the community centers, um, not only with their Holocaust educational opportunities, but also with the upstander and anti-bullying campaign. I can't tell you how much that means to us and our community. Uh, not only do we fight for diversity, we also fight against those things that keep us from diversity. And that's one of those things that we are uh, honored to have you guys there. I'm also looking forward to having you guys in the heart of District 3. Um, it means a lot to me uh, to have you there, and I can't think of a better continued use of that building uh, than continue to the work uh, that we talk about in, um, uh, in, in, in continuing with this commitment to diversity, commitment to making our community the best it possibly can be. So I'm honored to support that today, honored to be, um, uh, be part of that, and honored to do whatever I can do to make sure this transition moves quickly. Um, and, uh, and now the hard work will be ahead of us to raise money. So, uh, uh, but I think it's going to be great. I think it's a great vision for our community. And I think, as, um, as uh, Commissioner Ortiz says, it's a great example for those who want to come into downtown Orlando. Uh, they need to also not only be part of a good com business community, they also need to contribute back. And this is a way that we're taking uh, your comments and com your um, uh, investment and, c and contributing back to the diversity of our community. So I'm honored to support it in uh, every way possible. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Let's move to District 4, Commissioner Sheehan. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I echo the comments on the Holocaust Memorial and Resource Center and look forward to ha having that area really energized because it's kind of a, you know, been kind of dead for a while and I think we're going to have a lot of exciting activity there. And I walk by it every single day on the Urban Trail, which brings me to item B5. I'm so glad to see that the Orlando Urban Trail gap is an extension is going to be done in a downtown because so many people come to that terminus and get and get confused and now they're going to be able to see how to actually ride into downtown. So very, very excited to see that and, and as well as linking all of our trails throughout downtown. Um, on item C5 today, temporary lot for downtown recreation center and the Pottery Stew. That's very, very important because we're losing our parking lot to the UCF construction. So I want to thank FPR and, and real estate for making sure that we have a place to park at the rec center and, and the Pottery Studio. And um, on item F1 today on housing, United Against Poverty Rehabilitation and Upgrade Facility on Michigan Street. They do a lot of important work feeding the working poor, and this is actually for their food distribution facility, so I'm delighted to see that they're continuing to grow. And uh, I also want to thank Billy Hadaway for item J2, Lake Lausona Aesthetic Sign. You wouldn't think it would take almost a year to get a sign approved through FDOT, but Billy, thank you for finally <laughs> persevering so that poor Lake Lausona neighborhood could finally get their, uh, get their sign approved. But again, sometimes when you're working with the state, it takes a while to, to, get, uh, to get things approved. But Billy, thank you so much for persevering and getting us this final uh, approval. I appreciate it. And that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll move to District 5, Commissioner Hill. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and I just want to echo uh, Commissioner Stewart and Ortiz and Commissioner Sheehan about the uh, Holocaust Center moving over to District 3. I look at that old chamber building as something also historic. Mm -hmm. Ever since I was a little girl, I remember riding around a uh, bike around that building, and Mr. Jacob Stewart actually hired me uh, when I was a CETA student uh, there uh, as a uh, filing. So. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and along with that, I think when I got my briefing, I was quite excited to hear that you are going to address civil rights there in that building. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that the city quite mm -hmm. is lacking when we have a true civil rights museum. Mm -hmm. So I see that as the beginning of at least addressing civil rights throughout this nation, especially here in Central Florida. So thank you, thank you, thank you for including that uh, at that resource center. Uh, I do believe uh, our youth and throughout the, the nation, if we don't know our, our history, mm -hmm. we're doomed to repeat it. Uh, but we must know it in order to have a greater future. So thank you for, for my community on the west side bringing something that we can uh, bring our children and our grandchildren so that they can know their past. So thank you. And walking side by side and hand by hand fighting for the rights of all people, not just some people. So I think this is just a beautiful, beautiful project. And, and to say $20 million don't hurt that you're bringing to invest <laughs> in the city. So thank you for that. Uh, it was quite, and when we talk about the Holocaust Center, uh, uh, we just had our MLK uh, weekend. And it was uh, quite a festive weekend. Uh, it's busy for all of us. Um, we had our downtown uh, parade, which uh, was very high energy, and it was family friendly. Many people came out. It was great weather. Uh, I just like to say thank you to Southwest Mercedes Benz. Uh, probably never owned one, but I was riding in a drop top convertible, 2018 jet black, <laughs> and it was it was just a beautiful car to ride to ride in. Uh, and then we had the 20, I attended the 2017 Eagle Awards, um, and they addressed uh, many of the businesses here in the Central Florida area that made a major impact here in the city of Orlando when it came to small businesses. And I like to thank uh, our urban uh, Paramore Department under the leadership of Walter Hawkins and Mr. Thomas Chapman. Uh, with their assistance, I was able to sponsor two senior homes there in Paramore where we prepped them, we washed, we uh, primed them, and then they uh, painted them for me. And I'd like to say a thank you to your brother, uh, Mr. Charles Eames. He donated all of his time to oversee that project and, and prep it for us along with one of his uh, protégés. So a special thank you to Mr. Charles Ings for volunteering to oversee that project. And those two senior homes were homes that we could not put on our rehab project because usually they were so old and they could not uh, acquire proper insurance for us to, and thank you Marcia for your leadership in that, uh, helping put that together. We've been working on it for a year. I know last year we tried, but we felt a little short on time. So thank you for keeping the irons on the fire and, and helping me helping us complete that. And with that saying, uh, Mayor, I saw a great post that you put out earlier this morning when you said that uh, the city wasn't shut down for business. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, Washington followed your lead an hour and a, <laughs> an hour and a half ago. We're back open for business in Washington. So with that being said, uh, let's move forward. Uh, your next, please. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Commissioner Hill, and we'll move to District Six, Commissioner Rings. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, again to um, item B two reference the memorandum of understanding for the Holocaust uh, Memorial Resource and Educational Center. Uh, I think that's a great thing, and I think is really great for Orlando specifically. Uh, as we look at building and continuing to build downtown Orlando, the Holocaust Museum there is going to be a great benefit to the city of Orlando and the Orlando region, so I really uh, do support this effort. And then also on item B4, Mayor, um, that was the use of the Polk County contract with the IS Water Company for review of unbilled and misbilled utility services. At agenda review, I um, uh, put in a no vote for this. 
uh, but I'm going to change that no vote and actually support this item. Uh, Byron and Chris did talk to me to give me a little bit more information concerning this particular issue, but they understood my point, and I really appreciate that. Uh, also, um, I brought greetings with the Orlando Neighborhood Improvement Corporation's uh, breakfast uh, and team building and program showcase uh, 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 breakfast that took place at, uh, at uh, what's the name of the apartment? No, 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 the apartment's right there. The center right there, Terry and Church Street. Anyway, that's where it was. Um, this Onic breakfast uh, was uh, uh, involving the community and where I participated with the uh, Onic at the Boca Club Apartments, uh, Bob Ansley and uh, Alexis Collins. Uh, both are involved in this program. Bob Ansley used to work for the city of Orlando, but he and Bob Frankie uh, left the city and started Onic. <clears throat> Orlando Neighborhood Improvement Corporation. So that breakfast was to help with their team building program and to showcase some out of town visitors that were there to see how they cooperate with the local business and other businesses too. Uh, the 27th annual Arthur Pappy Kennedy um, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. prayer breakfast was held on Monday, January 15th at Faith Hall at First Baptist Church Orlando. I attended that event. It was very well uh, attended. Uh, lots of uh, good uh, programming that went on at that event. And I believe it was Evans High School that was there as a guest choir that assisted with uh, a lot of the performances. And then I attended the Dr. Martin Luther King Parade in Orlando and Eatonville on January the 13th, and that was a Saturday. That morning in Orlando and that evening in Eatonville, or afternoon in Eatonville, both parades were very well attended, uh, especially in Eatonville. So many kids from all over the Central Florida area, including Eatonville, were there. Uh, for that parade, and so much of great energy was there uh, that was dispersed. The kids were so happy to see uh, all of those that were participating in the parade, so it was a great uh, event. And then on January 12th, I had the Remembering Haiti event, and this was uh, held here at Orlando City Hall. The um, theme of the event was the color of friendship and solidarity. Of course, you know January 12th was when Haiti had its uh, deadly earthquake that took place. So we're always remembering Haiti and the people of Haiti and trying to do everything that we can to help and strengthen that particular country as well. Uh, Pierre Max Charles, who's the Council General of the Orlando Haitian Consulate, was there on hand and he also presented me with a little plaque of appreciation and I was very thankful uh, for that. And coming up um, January 26, I will be hosting the 2018 World Conference of Mayors uh, VIP reception here at Orlando City Hall Rotunda. And uh, the Honorable Johnny Ford, uh, former mayor of Tuskegee, Alabama, was the founder and, and uh, director general for the World Conference of Mayors. Uh, the National Policy Alliance will also be there. The Historic Black Towns and Settlements Alliance will be there as well. This is during the same weekend uh, of the Zora Neale Hurston Festival that will take place in Eatonville, Florida. And of course, we're having a special guest, Mr. Al Husino Ba. Uh, he's the C CEO of One Africa. And the Honorable uh, Belvin Perry, Jr., retired judge, will perform the oath of office ceremony. Uh, so the World Conference of Mayors are also known as the United Nations of Cities, and they were first convened in 1984. And its primary objective is to stimulate positive and constructive relations among mayors, 
around the world based on interlocking interests and concerns. And most of these mayors are African-American mayors that really come together and, and try and have a big impact upon uh, not only the U.S., but, but the uh, world, specifically dealing with China and also with Africa. And so that's all of my comments that I have, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. You're Hanks. welcome. <laughs> did, did he say that's all? <laughs> uh, Commissioner for, Gray, bring us home. Thank you. For all, the students in the, for all the students in the audience, when you're the last commissioner to go, one of your duties is to make sure the mayor and all the commissioners adequately covered things on the agenda. I think they have. So I will make a motion to approve the consent. Second. <laughs> Second. Motion by Commissioner Gray. And Commissioner Gray has all his information on his website. <laughs> I didn't even say it, but thank you, sir. <laughs> Uh, let's see, motion by Commissioner Gray, second by Commissioner Stewart. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, and so the motion carries. Let's thank you. <laughs> Okay, anybody that was just here for the consent agenda and would like to make a hasty exit, now would be the great time to probably do that. <coughs> hasty. Congrats. Mm -hmm. Not you, Chief. You don't get to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's without objection recess the city council meeting and uh, convene the CRA meeting. First order of business is accepting minutes from the November seventh advisory. Second. Motion by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Sheehan. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Let's pose motion carries. Number two is approving CRA meeting minutes from the second. December 11th. Motion by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Sheehan. Did you need anything on either of those, mm -hmm. Thomas? All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Further business, Thomas? There is none, Mayor. Okay, aye. thank you. Then the CRA will stand adjourned and we will convene the Neighborhood Improvement District Board of Directors. Uh, one item business, which is accepting the meeting minutes from the advisory board from their December 13th, 2017 meeting. So moved. Second. A motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Hill. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, so the motion carries. And we will adjourn the Neighborhood Improvement District Board of Directors meeting, and we will reconvene the City Council meeting. We have already taken care of the mm -hmm. new business item which was the donation of the Rogers Keeney building. So that will bring us to hearings, ordinances on first reading number one. Um, at agenda review, a number of commissioners uh, indicated they would like to have a presentation related to this. So Jason is going to do just that. And I think he prepared this quickly in the last 30 minutes. So let's have at it, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Nice Mayor and Commissioners. Too, I'm Jason Burden, Chief City Planner. I'm here to talk about short-term rentals and a uh, proposed land development code amendment before you today. Um, quickly, um, an overview of what I'm going to be talking about. We had a council workshop in November 2016 where we reviewed what was happening around the country with our peer cities and got a little bit of a direction to go back, review that, and make a recommendation that came through our municipal planning board, the first reading of which of that ordinance is, is the subject of the hearing today. Um, we've tried to do some reasonable rules and regulations that I'll go over. Um, I'm going to try to s explain the current city and state regulations and how they relate to the proposal, explore how other communities are accommodating short-term rentals, discuss the staff recommendation, and a little bit about implementation. As you might know by reading the council item, we are delaying the implementation of this particular ordinance to work through the details of how to implement this and we're using a couple different cities as models for us so we, we have a good idea of how to implement it and do a more proactive code enforcement regime for this instead of a more passive role. 
Um, quickly, short-term rentals at a glance. We have about 1,200 to 2,000 short-term rentals inside, these, inside of the city. They're across multiple online platforms. Most of them are on Airbnb, about 90% of them. They're mostly concentrated within the traditional city. That's our pre-World War II city, historic districts in Metro West and Baldwin Park. It's really difficult to determine how many successful short-term rentals that we have because we have limited data available from the online platforms themselves. We don't know the frequencies of their bookings or how successful they are in actually marketing their property. So it's a little bit difficult because we don't have a, a way of sharing that information from the online platforms. The county comptroller collects bed tax through agreements with online platforms individually. He has an agreement with um, Airbnb currently and it's not an audible um, um, way that he can actually verify. They just send him a check every month is what I understand. Um, most homeowners associations have standard covenants, codes, and restrictions. They're called CCNRs for short that limit rentals to periods of no less than six months, but we are not a party to those, so we don't enforce that. So a lot of people tend to ask us what's going on with their particular homeowners association, but unfortunately we can't enforce it for them. Um, generally though, short-term rentals are rentals or rentals of residential properties that last less than 30 days. So. In 1991, we were kind of at the foray of this and come up, came up with the idea of, of classifying different uses in the code as it exists today. We have commercial dwelling units that are limited in where they can be located inside of our city. We have hotel and motels and we have bed and breakfast even um, that are sometimes located in residential zoning districts. Just an idea of some of the different zoning districts where these things are allowed. Commercial dwelling units, as you can see, are mostly in those 03 mixed use and MXD. These are generally um, multi-family residential zoning districts. They're not in single family residential zoning districts. So they generally have to get a business tax receipt and um, conform with our multi-family development standards. Um, hotel motels, these are places where people go to visit typically less than seven days. Um, they're prohibited in all residential zoning districts. They require business tax receipts. Similar to that, we have bed and breakfast, which is an accessory use that we allow in our R2B, so townhouse and duplex zoning districts and above, where you can have a bed and breakfast and it limits it to a certain percentage and it requires owner occupancy at this time in our current code. The state has licensing regulations for that as well and generally from our perspective as staff, we're seeing it as a place where you have multiple parties going and booking and, and sharing uh, like a hotel. I don't know the person that might be in the room next door to me, so that's being operated as a business. Um, next is our enforcement is a, a somewhat passive right now. It's, it's a complaint basis system basically, so if someone does something very egregious, they go through our normal code enforcement process. We've had different problems over the different years with, with, with homes, but it's a very difficult process to enforce and regulate because of the due process that it takes for the current um, code enforcement passive regime that we have today. Um, a lot of the complaints we get is everything from, you know, I found a listing on the online platform to parking concerns to not property license, illegal use in the residential neighborhood, new guests arriving constantly, the loss of a neighbor, and even people knock on my door and they're looking for the short term rental and they got the wrong address. So it runs the gamut of, of what actually happens. Just to give you an idea of what's happening at the statewide level in 2001, the state prohibited local jurisdictions from passing short term rental ordinances or vacation rental ordinances. They backed that up in 2014 with only restricting um, frequency and duration of, of short-term rentals. In other words, in San Francisco, you can only rent your unit out for 75% of the, or you have to live in it 75% of the year and 25% of the year you can lease it out. In New Orleans, it's, it's 90 days. So those are examples of duration and frequency regulations. Many of you might have been to Savannah, you have to stay a minimum of two or three days in your particular, that would be a duration type of stay. So those types of ordinances are illegal in the state of Florida. Um, any, any 
scheme for short-term rentals that was adopted prior to 2011 has been grandfathered by the state. So we have one of those ordinances right now in place because of the, our regime for short-term rentals includes the commercial dwelling units and those restrictions on how long you actually have to rent a residential unit out for, which is a minimum of 30 days. Um, there are existing grandfather regulations throughout the state, including Orange County, Jacksonville, Key West, Miami Beach, and St. Petersburg. It's a little confusing what we can, but we, we have made some conclu conclusions about what we can do under the state law. We cannot regulate the frequency and duration like I explained. We can potentially deregulate short-term rentals, and we can allow for reasonable accessory uses, you know, and that's what one of the things that we've, we've studied out and have, have come to a conclusion with that I'll present a little bit later. Um, there are recent ordinances that deal with performance standards, which we're kind of incorporating into the, the proposal that we have before you today. Um, Fort Lauderdale has licensing and registration schemes, which tend to be popular because it provides some, some light on where these things are occurring and contact information. Same thing happened in Hollywood, Flagler County, and Panama City Beach. Throughout the United States, there's lots of different types of schemes that different cities have come up with. Atlanta and Oklahoma City outright prohibit them. They are limited in certain zoning districts in places like Savannah and New Orleans. New Orleans famously went through a process of doing um, data sharing with Airbnb with mixed results. Um, the type of model that's before you today is sort of like limited to hosted units only, and it tends to be a, 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 an easy way of enforcing short-term rental regulations. Ours, our proposal today is kind of modeled after Denver and Los Angeles, but similar restrictions you'll find in Chicago and Portland. And of course, like I described before, New York, San Francisco, and New Orleans limit frequency and duration, which is something that we're not exactly allowed to do within the state. There are a lot of different types of community concerns. The different feedback that we have gotten thus far in the public record suggests that half the people really want us to deregulate short-term rentals and allow people to do whatever they want, and the other half are telling us, well, <laughs> we don't want this in our neighborhood. So what we've tried to do is come down the middle and do something a little bit more reasonable. So some of the community concerns have been there's a commercial use in the residential neighborhood. There's a reduction in long-term rental housing stock that could impact housing affordability. Certainly nuisance complaints, noise, parking, trash, late hours in traffic. I'm, I've, I could never come across a person that hasn't had an issue with somebody that had an Airbnb down the street that might have gone off the hook a little bit one day. Um, certainly the, the business tax receipts and paying taxes is a concern. The lack of oversight and management can be can be a concern, the difficulty in regulating, the loss of a permanent neighbor in a residential neighborhood is a big concern to make sure that, that those neighborhoods are stable. And of course, loss of a residential unit in a market where 45% of our population is rent burdened or pays more than 30% of their income on rent or their mortgage is somewhat of a concern because as we take those units off the market and make them hotel units, for lack of a better term, or short-term stays, the less housing units we have to support our market. And in a place like Orlando that has 65 million visitors, it's a bigger impact um, than you could have in other places throughout the country. Um, there are a lot of benefits, though, that we want to um, go over, which is why we have a proposal before you today. It encourages our citizens' participation in the sharing economy. Um, this is like you can come to the party and eat the cake, or they'll eat the cake anyway, so you might as well play along with it. Um, you also get tourists the opportunity to experience our Main Street districts, our traditional city, or downtown, and other types of areas of the city that are not typically visited by tourists, and that can be a real positive towards our local businesses. Um, it allows for enhanced cultural exchange and hosted units when people come from internationally to stay in units and they're really interested in our historic districts and, and our culture in the, here in the United States and in Orlando in particular. Um, it could be an extra source of income for homeowners and long-term renters to stay in their units um, as a cottage industry. And certainly it could be a temporary housing op option for residents with emergent needs for accommodations such as those um, relocating here from Puerto Rico or what, what not on a, in a legal situation. Um, the elements of our proposal really is only allow for hosted visits, so the resident must be present in the unit. You can have an accessory amount of bedrooms 
that is proposed for short-term rental inside your unit. So if you had a guest bedroom or a subordinate amount of bedrooms, you would register that with the city potentially, and then you would be able to rent that out. A single booking at a time, um, in other words, you can have one party in, in at a time. If you have multiple partings, there's parking concerns and other things that ha tend to happen. Otherwise, it should be considered a full bed and breakfast, need to get state licensing, and be in the proper zoning district that tends to be more intensive zoning districts. Um, one of the elements of our program is also an online registration platform and posting that registration on the website itself. So your listing would list the location and the contact information so it allows a certain amount of transparency to both the residents that are surrounding you as well as the people as well as the people that are renting your units. And of course, I went over earlier that we're sunrising this regulation once we're, we're trying to deal with the zoning issues initially, and then coming up with an interactive platform and a marketing scheme to educate our residents on how to um, actually register and participate in this new sharing economy opportunity. Um, related to this is the current bed and breakfast regulation also has a requirement that the property owner live on site, we're suggesting that be changed to the proprietor. And if possible, we would like to modify in the future our commercial dwelling units to allow no minimum night stay. Currently, there's a seven night minimum, like a traditional um, um, seasonal rental type of, type of situation. We can't do it now because we don't want to affect our preemption status with the state, but if it's possible to do that in the future, we would like to do that. Um, there's lots of different policies from our growth management plan that are impacted by this. Everything from we've always been supportive of mixed uses and accessory uses, so this is just another accessory use that we're adding towards our residential zoning districts. We're accommodating a variety of living situations and family situations where they can have their own cottage industry, accommodating emerging housing problems which are acute in our, our community, allows residents to supplement their income, and an accessory use is assumed to have no different impacts than existing residential unit. In other words, it's no different than my grandma having to come visit me for the weekend. Allows for our enhanced cultural exchange and doesn't detriment property rights and doesn't exacerbate our housing supply. And with that, I'll take any questions. And since this is a hearing, um, both on first and second reading, um, and it has the potential to change the uses that are allowed within the city, it requires an actual vote to hear this item before 5 p.m. So, Mayor, I think you have some um, a script to talk about that later on. I do. Okay, questions for Jason? Commissioner Gray? Yeah, Jason, real quick. You <clears throat> said we currently have a enforcement challenge. Does this ordinance eliminate that, or are we going to continue to have an enforcement challenge? Well, what a lot of cities have done, and like I said, we're taking the, the Denver approach, if you would, is requiring online registration and potentially some proactive measures where we're sending out or we would hire potentially a third party and go out to RFP for that. And what they do is they'll send letters out to folks to, to enforce and take screenshots on a weekly basis so we can more proactively enforce the regulation. Um, I, I think most of you, as we individually talked about this in caucus, we, we discussed how the enforcement scheme is really important to each of you in order to make sure that this goes off without a hitch um, in our residential zoning districts to make those types of assurances. So we're looking at that type of a program in places like Denver and Los Angeles where they had two or three percent compliance with their short-term rental regulations, they've gotten that up to 80 percent, 90 percent compliance essentially. So okay. even listing it without the registration on the online platform is a potential code enforcement challenge for us that we can potentially enforce in the future under this ordinance. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Stewart. Um, I'm trying to look for a simplistic understanding of it. So what we're trying to really do <clears throat> from the standpoint of uh, those, wait, this was overarching to all of our land development code or is it overarching to R1, R2, R3? I mean, the idea is that if I'm in an R3 now today, I guess in a condo, um, um, uh, would I be able to, to um, uh, lease out a bedroom I've got in my condo? Um, 
uh, is it like regulated to that? Because aren't you already in commercial in the in the condo? I mean, you, you, you understand? I'm trying to figure out. Sure. If if you were in an area that would allow for commercial dwelling units today, certainly you could do that, and that's why we'd like to change it so it, it more coincides with what's happening. But the lion's share of this is talking about renting out rooms within single-family residential zoning districts. Those. R1 district and to some lesser degree R2 types of districts. So um, since it's already happening in our community in a, in a significant basis, um, that's one of the reasons what we're trying to get a handle on it, accommodate it, but regulate it in such a way that's reasonable and doesn't have detrimental impacts to the surrounding neighbors. So you'd still have the same enforcement scheme and registration requirements in those mixed use and multifamily districts. It's just it's a much more clearer process by which we're going about doing it now. I'm looking at um, when you go to Airbnb, you see kind of three types. You see renting a home, you see renting a room generally, and then the over one, you also see renting a condo. Correct. I know that there's, I say scores, 40, 50, 60 of condos in downtown Orlando where they advertise looking over uh, Lake Yola and so how, how are those regulated in such so a way? The locations where we allow commercial dwelling units, those are the locations where you would be able to rent the entire unit potentially. In those locations that don't allow for commercial dwelling units, you would only be able to use it as an accessory use. In other words, you would be able to rent out a room. Okay. And that's how we've set it up. So again, I'm a little simplistic. So if, yeah. the, if, if the view allows you to have a condo and to rent the condo out as a whole unit, if the view allows that because the view is set up in that way, then we've got no real restriction over that. Correct. The view has, because the view has restriction because they allow it. Correct, because today we would allow that as a commercial dwelling unit. There's just a duration issue that we have right now that we would like to fix to be more consistent with state law. Yeah. Now, if it's a single family residential district, we've always regulated rooming houses and um, um, community dwelling units, you know, um, joint dwelling units, types of things like that. That's kind of where it's being affected, and we're kind of drawing the line in the sand about how much you can actually do within those single yeah. family residential One zones. of the comments that Commissioner Sheehan made earlier today and I hadn't thought about, I was going to share with you, and I think you've got a little bit more research, is that in where there are areas where the HOA um, is non-voluntary and has the ability to put covenants on their use in condo associations or even in Baldwin Park as an example, um, the enforcement becomes a little bit more of a challenge <clears throat> because the next door neighbor complains to the city. <clears throat> Pardon me, but the city is not the one that has the enforcement. They could register with the city, except that their own covenant say they can't do that. Correct. And what I've found, or what we found as staff, is that um, typically it's easier for an HOA to approach the city if there's a code complaint and make us do the dirty work for them, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. So what happens typically when there's a conflict with the HOA, if, there, if there's an option of having the city enforce your regulation, if it's compatible, they tend to come to our code enforcement scheme first. Um, I'm, some of the permits, if, if we find out on the first floor right now, you'll notice if you're within an HOA, we do require HOA sign off for that particular, since this is a land development type of a use restriction. We're not necessarily proposing it as part of the ordinance, but it could be one of those reasonable rules that could be um, a courtesy requirement that we might put before our our, um, our applicants so they can make sure that they have that sign off from their HOA that, as well. That clearly makes a lot of sense, only because we put the onus back on uh, the, the landlord, le le lease or, the lease or not leasee. Correct. Um, give me a time frame of when we expect to see, I mean, we, we look at enforceable in July 1, I guess, is that what we're looking at. Correct. Um, when do we really expect to see some of these details worked out? I mean, uh, philosophically, I'm not sure that any of us disagree with doing this. The question becomes the devil's in the details. So yeah, right when now those details come out, how do we get a chance to look Right at now, it? it's really a matter of figuring out whether we can allow it from a land use policy mm -hmm. perspective. So it's definitely in the planning stages, if you would. We're also working with our purchasing department to see what types of um, selection processes that other cities that are contemporaneous with us could apply here, like Fort Lauderdale hired a, hired a third party 
we were researching out whether we could use that as well. Denver hired the same party as well, and many other cities like Los Angeles hired the same party. We're researching out whether it's easy to do that or if we're going to have to send out a separate RFP. And we're also ske already scheduled a meeting to kick off a public education campaign with our communications department as well as um, um, our T department to figure out how do we implement this via our open counter platform um, so that it becomes an easier, seamless online platform for our residents to um, register and, and make it somewhat simple and more sharing economy. So the so time frame is we're looking at that by the end of May kind of thing? Is that what we're looking Certainly, at? Certainly. Um, it would be it would it would come forward certainly we're, we're trying to get everything lined up and whatnot like that um of course i'm i'm charged with trying to oversee everything up until this point and i'm still being involved in the implementation afterwards but we have an interdepartmental effort on different fronts for each one of these different assignments that i've been discussing with you today um we're hoping to have it all in place by july 1st if, if we have a positive <coughs> recommendation off the constant day I guess let me ask it a more direct way. Do we, do we look that we're probably going to have some type of amendment to the ordinance to postpone it from July 1 to September 1? I mean, I, or do you really think we can get this thing put together in the course of the next three or four months? I think we could get it together in the next three or four months, but it's highly dependent on whether we can piggyback our purchasing off of other the processes point? that are, are happening. Yeah. The, the indications that I have thus far is yes, but it's, it still takes a little bit of research. Okay. And certainly we can't go forward without having um, the council's approval today with doing that process. And the last question is tell me about the interaction between Scott Randolph's uh, and tax collector and us. Well, interesting thing. One of the things that uh, we've talked with both Phil Diamond and and on um, the state, there are different competing bills at the state level for either completely preempting cities or making it more clear what they're required to do as short-term rentals for signing up for state taxes and county taxes and different things like that. We are trying to incorporate into our online platform both registration with the state to collect state sales taxes as well as with Phil Diamond. So before you would get a registration with us, we'll ensure that you actually register with them so they can collect the proper taxes. And that's one of their concerns. So to make it seamless so people are, who are used to doing the internet, we're trying to incorporate that all into the concept that we want to bring forward into implementation. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Commissioner Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Jason, uh, I have a community that is very against this, and, and I've been doing some research. And Have you been reading on some of the reports around the nation, uh, Voice of San Diego, why your short-term rental is a problem, Redwood City, California, Crime Trend Peninsula warns of burglar, burglar uh, utilizing short-term rentals, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, report short-term rentals responsible for 60% of the crime, sexual assaults, things like that. There's safety issues, there's code enforcement issues. We don't have enough personnel to cover the code enforcement violations that are going on right now. I'm fighting that every single day. I've been asking for, for more money to get more code enforcement officers. And now, you just said a little while ago that we can't enforce the ones we have in a city. We, we're having problems with that. So how are we gonna deal with the ones how are we going to know that there's a, cause the policy, the legislation we're trying to pass here uh, demands that there's a person living in a house? How, how can we control that somebody doesn't come over and buy a few properties and, and plays that game until somebody finally reports it? Um, parking issues, uh, as I said before, safety issues. Uh, right now, you can go on the internet and find out in the city of Orlando how many, you know, how many people are doing this, and we haven't enforced that. So how can we guarantee our people that we're going to be enforcing this other item? We're just adding to, to, the, to the problem. Yes, I'm very familiar with both Nashville, Redwood City is, mm -hmm. is the next door neighbor community to a previous city I used to work for, as well as San Diego. I'm familiar with the situation in each one of those cities. And what I've done is researched out the best practices throughout the nation, including Nashville, they have their own set of challenges here, and the latest iteration is like the Denver model that people are going to. Um, New Orleans went through a process of data sharing and management, and they have a department of 14 that works with um, 
um, enforcing their short-term rental regulations. What we're trying to do is pass an ordinance and then an implementation scheme with a proactive code enforcement scheme, which we do not have now that would be revenue neutral. So when you get a license, it would not only pay for that third party enforcement, but also folks to monitor it here at the city as well. But we're violating, we're violating a simple principle. Residential areas are residential areas, are not business areas. So right now I have a fight in one of my neighborhoods because an ALF, which is preempted by the state, we don't, we, there's nothing we can do on that one. People don't even want that ALF over there. Now we're going to be dealing with this Airbnb uh, short rentals, uh, short term rentals. What's next? Restaurants on, on residential areas? And I, I where are we heading with all this? I somewhat agree with you because what we've tried to do is rather than running out the entire unit, which is where those problems occur, is drawing the line in the sand towards having the hosted requirement and the requirement that they be residents at that property. And those registration requirements are no different than for each of you as sitting council members to run for your office. So having that type of a parity and making sure that it is an actual resident in the unit or they have sign-offs from the property owner creates an enforcement scheme that's more proactive and much different than what we have today. This is all theory, what you're telling Correct. me. There's no, it's all theory. We have nothing uh, n tangible that we can say this is gonna work this way. It's all theory. Right now, the, only, the other thing you're gonna find is a bunch of people that they won't even register. They're going to be running this, and they're not even going to be using the, the legitimate companies like Airbnb or whatnot. They're going to be doing it on their own. Yes. And it's, we're going to be chasing people all around the city. We don't have the personnel nor the funding to be doing this. I think there is, a, there is that issue. I, I can definitely empathize with it, but I think this is, if you do want to regulate this use within the city, you know, absent of the state legislature taking up this issue one more time this this session if we don't do it we would just have the same problems that we have today with um short-term rentals throughout our residential neighborhoods but we're magnifying correct. it if we do this we're going to magnify it we're going to make it greater <laughs> there could be an argument either way um what we're suggesting here is that if we have a proactive code enforcement scheme define hosted units, which is the best code enforcement the city can have, is having somebody in that unit hosting at, we tend to have less parking problems, less party house problems that they have in Nashville, less issues like that. And throughout the nation, the different communities that have adopted similar types of ordinances, be it Denver, Chicago, Los Angeles, most of their short-term rental issues go away. So We are a city that pride ourselves on almost guaranteeing to our residents peace and tranquility in their neighborhoods. Mark my words, that's going to change. It's going to change. But thank you. Thank you. Mr. She and then Commissioner Hill. I, I have a couple of concerns and uh, you know I've, I've, I've gone out to the neighborhoods as I've had a chance and there's been a couple that I haven't been able to get to like Yola Heights is one of them um, and, and I, I did talk to, I did actually get the word out. It was kind of a short time because we found out about this with Martin Luther King Day. We didn't get the agenda till Wednesday and then Thursday and Friday, the only couple days I've got to let the residents know that this is coming up. So it was a little, little short notice. But um, the issues that I'm hearing from the neighborhoods is a concern. If there is a preemption, can we put in it that upon legislative preemption that we revert to the previous restrictions because, again, we, we pass regulations and then we get preempted to the legislature and they're saying, are we better off not doing anything? I mean, most are supportive of the rules that we're putting in place, but the concern is that we get preempted and then we don't have any protections at all. I would agree with you. And Mr. Shepard wrote a fantastic severability clause that I'm sure he's itching to explain to you right now. Yes. <laughs> I like severability clauses. Uh, yeah. So we did put a, a, a slightly different severability clause in this ordinance than we do with most of our ordinances. And basically what it says is that if there is, um, for some reason, we lose our grandfather status by virtue of adopting this ordinance, that we would revert back to our prior existing ordinance. Okay. So we don't think that we're going to lose our preemption or our grandfather's status, but if we did, this ordinance would simply revert back to the, to the old ordinance. Now, having said that, keep in mind, and as you've heard Commissioner Ortiz mention earlier today, 
the legislature can always take away our grandfather's status if they wish to. So far, they have given us a grandfather status by saying, hey, if you had an, an ordinance adopted prior to 2011, you're grandfathered. But keep in mind, the legislature could do away with that, and there's nothing we could do about that. But assuming they keep the existing grandfathering provision mm -hmm. or something very similar to it, we're confident that we're going to maintain our grandfathered status. What's more is that we don't think we lose um, our grandfather status under the preemption because what the current statute says is what we can't do is regulate the duration or frequency of these uses. Mm -hmm. What we've written here is a regulation that is not at all involving the duration or frequency. It's simply saying you can in fact do this where you're not allowed to do it today on the major condition that you are living on the site. Mm -hmm. So it's a, an accessory to a residential use as, as opposed to becoming a um, commercial dwelling unit, which is a separate use in our, in our zoning code. So in other words, we think we're good if the state legislature allows us to maintain our mm -hmm. grandfathered status, but just keep in mind that they can always undermine that, and so we're gonna have to keep our, our voices heard in Tallahassee to, to, to make sure that that um, provision stays in the statute. Home rule, right, Commissioner Ortiz? Yeah. Um, another concern that I've heard is that um, that it be owner only, and or that there has to be a um, the permission of the property owner before a, rent, a long, even a long term rental could enter. I mean, we even have that with chickens. You have to get the you can't have chickens unless you have the permission of your you know, the property owner, but we're gonna allow them to do an Airbnb. I mean, I think that's kind of ridiculous. So I would think that that would be something that would that would be um, important, that it that be owner, uh, owner only. Um, and uh, there was another point, the Los Owner Fern Creek Neighborhood Hist Historic District, when I brought it up to them, they said that there is a restriction on commercial activity in their historic district um, adoption. So my question is, would that preclude Airbnb in their historic district because of the preemption, because of the regulation that they put in place? I'll address the first issue about ownership only. Okay. That's one of the reasons why we have um, a notarized permission of the property owner. And okay. anything that we do in planning requires that the property owner enter right. into the land use permit that we do in planning. So that's one of the reasons why we have that provision in the code. Okay. Um, we don't want to get into the business of potentially being discriminatory towards people whether they own or rent within okay. our city. Um, so that's one of okay. the reasons why we have that sign off from the property owner contained within the, the proposal. The other issue is the commercial activity. Since we see this as an accessory use, like a home office types of use, it's not going to such a, a, a potential um, conversion of the entire unit towards an entire commercial activity, so we're keeping it within the rights, the property rights of an accessory use within the zoning district. So, so Mayor, if I may, Commissioner, just to sort of translate what Jason just said there. In the Lake La Sona um, HP district, you have that special ordinance that says commercial uses are not allowed within the HP um, district. The way that this ordinance is drafted, this use, if allowed, would be an accessory residential use. So in other words, it would be allowed within the Lake La Sona HP district because it's not a commercial use. Now, you always have the prerogative, um, if you believe it's appropriate, to amend that HP ordinance to forbid this accessory um, residential use. But as the ordinance exists today, it would not forbid, forbid them from having it. All right, so if they have the prerogative to amend, would that apply to all historic districts or just La Sona Fern Creek because they had this particular prohibition in it? You could, if you chose, amend any of the HP ordinances if that's what you chose to do. Okay, well, it's really up to them. I mean, I'm just wondering what the what the options are for, for concerned neighborhoods. Um, the, 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 I had some concerns, but the one reason I really like this, though, is, you know, we've got a lot of these duplexes that are being torn down and condo duplexes being built, and I'm thinking that this might actually encourage owner occupation and keep some of those smaller duplexes that could they could rent out half of it as an Airbnb, and actually we might actually have better use in these R2 districts than having these huge condo duplexes. I like the idea of the owner occupancy very much, as do the neighborhood. So that's one really good thing about it um, that, that I've heard, the feedback that I've heard from the neighborhoods. But they, there, but there were some concerns, and that's all, that's all I had. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Mayor. 
I'm asked Commissioner uh, Sheehan, I'm in support of this because of the opportunity that you may have for additional income and some other things we talked about, Jason. But how does this, uh, the more I think about it, how would this impact uh, Paramore area and District 6 where rooming houses are prevalent and this is the only form of housing for some of the low income that has been in place for decades. Would this, um, in a roundabout way, what Commissioner uh, uh, Ortiz is saying about enforcement, it might be the flip side of enforcement for those that I represent to where now they're displaced. Yeah, currently we're not proposing to change the boarding and rooming house regulations or the community types of dwelling units and um, that, that we already have in place. What we're trying to do is parse it out in such a way that it becomes a super accessory type of use. Certainly, it's supportive of people trying to supplement their incomes, whether they're a renter or an owner, mm -hmm. so they can more easily afford um, right. their, their rent. And that's an acute problem that we have within our city that I'm, I'm sure you're very mm -hmm. familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're tr not trying to do something where it, it changes our current um, enforcement scheme and regime basically for boarding house. So they, so they will be protected? Correct. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have, Mayor. Let me see if there's anybody from the public who wants to testify. I have one more question, though, okay. if you don't mind. Um, Mr. Stewart. Um, Commissioner Sheehan brought up the point of having uh, is if somebody in one duplex and renting the other duplex. This does not allow that. Is that correct? Correct, because renting out the entire unit oh. is no longer an accessory unit potentially, but it's converting that unit and taking it off the market to turn into a short term or yeah. a hotel type of a use. So that would go against kind of the concept, the ordinance of having a subordinate amount uh, area of the unit itself. Now, if you had an accessory unit, it's accessory somewhat by definition. There's limitations to how much that is. The way that the ordinance is proposed is, is, is a 50% or less of that, um, of the amount of bedrooms that's on the individual unit itself. But if you lived in one side of a duplex and you decided to rent out the other, you're still taking that unit effectively off of the market and um, exacerbating our, our affordable housing problems and things like that. It, it depends on how the council feels, but the way that it's written today is in, in keeping that concept is is to hmm. not allow that to go forward like that on, and make sure that it's an accessory to each one of the different dwelling units. Hmm. Can, can I, can I, can I? Let me go to Commissioner Ortiz. He was oh, next sorry, up sorry. and then I'll come back to you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, this is becoming pretty interesting. There's a flip side to that. It's going to happen. That's exactly what's going to happen. People with two duplex, one is, is going to maybe live in one of them, and the other one is going to be all for rental. And there's no way we can control that because our code enforcement won't be able to, to do that. And more so, we're going to have a lot more than that all, all around the city, people doing all kinds of business, and it's going to be really hard to control. But, you know, fair warning. Um, other, concern that I, other concerns that I have in terms of, I know that you're talking about supplemental income and you, you made a comment about people coming from Puerto Rico. If this is just for a temporary use, people are not going to come, come from Puerto Rico to stay at a place like this. They're looking for permanent housing. So uh, uh, just to clarify that. Um, this is going to be a nightmare for law enforcement officers too. Because when incidents happen in some of these locations, finding who the owner is, if the owner is at the resident, and if it's not, Maintaining that relationship or, or eviction or, or any of these things is going to be even worse than what it is right now to deal with when somebody has to be evicted from a hotel. So I was wondering if there's a way that we can do maybe a pilot. If, if this is, if this seems like it's going to pass. I mean, because why not doing a pilot program or, or why not just selecting certain area of, of town and see how that works? Because this is, I don't know, I think it's uh, too radical, too fast. I don't see that there's, a, the, uh, there's uh, been consensus with the people. I don't know if anybody has checked with our residents, our communities, to see how they feel about this. I only know about my district how they feel, but I don't know about the other districts. So, uh, and, and I don't know if the commissions want to talk about that to see if they have checked with the, with the residents. I think this is a little too radical too soon. Thank you. I've, um, I've, been, I've been talking to a lot of my neighborhoods, like I say, that one of the most important ones I had not gotten to, to go to was Lake Yola Heights, but for the most part is I've been going to the different neighborhood associations. This addresses a lot of the concerns 
um, that they have in terms of it being uh, owner occupied in that. Um, but I wanted to ask about the duplexes because I assume because it was one, if it was owner occupied in one unit, that they would be able to rent out subordinate amount of rooms, even though it's a duplex. I, and I think that would be something that actually is is not taking away affordable housing because taking a duplex and tearing down a duplex with 800 square feet aside and building one with 2,000 square feet aside is well t is definitely taking that unit out of affordability and that's what's been happening in 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 my neighborhood. So I'm in favor of allowing duplexes to have some level of subordinate use with owner occupation because that's what the original duplexes were supposed to be was right. owner occupied and they could rent out the second half. And we didn't have start having problems with duplexes and du and density and everything like that until they started becoming condominiums and unaffordable for people and loaded up with kids in college and just be, you know becoming not a, not a single family use. So I'm actually more in favor of allowing duplex areas to be a subordinate use, which I know you're probably surprised to hear me say that, but um, but I am, and I just assumed that that would be the subordinate use of the homeowner. So again, uh, if, there, if, there's some, if that's something that we could amend later, I think that's certainly something that the neighborhoods would be in favor of, because again, they like the duplex uses and owner occupation. They like the idea of an owner-occupied rental unit. Sure. And okay. certainly this is the first reading of this, and okay. we can work that detail out if there was a, if the council agreed with you and you, if you made a motion to that effect, we could bring it back to, for a second reading if, if, you, if you so chose. It just depends on what you're comfortable with. Okay. Commissioner Hill. Yeah, I'm, I'm also in support of that when I start thinking about some of my seniors or baby boomers that might be retiring, and they're purchasing on our side or wanting to build duplexes and stay in one half and use the other for uh, retirement purposes. So I think that's something we should consider also. Okay. Jason, when do you envision we would bring this back for second reading? We would actually come back for second reading on February 12th, so that's something that we could add relatively easy in the ordinance. It's not an incredible change to the ordinance as it's written today. Do I need to make a motion, yeah, ma Mayor? Or? Well, we don't have the, the ordinance before oh, okay, us quite okay, yet. Okay, right, okay. Yeah. Kyle, did you have Yeah, that is, that is a change that we could make between first and second reading without having to go back to re-advertising. Um, Commissioner Sheehan, maybe Jason and I can get with you so we understand precisely what it is you want amended there, but that's a small amendment that can be made between first and second. Um, and if you pass this on first reading, we'll, we'll get with you and, and work out the details of that amendment. I just want to understand if you mean that having an owner occupied in one half of the duplex means that the other half of the duplex, Everybody. if it was in Airbnb, Airbnb would be considered subordinate for purposes of this ordinance. I would like to put an FAR restriction on that, though, perhaps. And there already is an FAR restriction, so. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. And the only reason why we proposed it the way we did is because um, just trying to support accessory dwelling units more often mm -hmm. than duplex, we thought that would be the default of the commission, um, the council today. So um, if you're comfortable with that, we have no problem with that. Is there a motion? I move approval. Mayor, did you uh, want to get public It input? is up here. I'm going to go ahead and get the ordinance in front of us and take public testimony. A second. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Hill. Okay, do we have any cards for public appearance? No. Is there anyone from the public who would like to testify related to this? Here, uh, if you'd come up, what I need you to do is come up here and then <laughs> mm -hmm. when you finish, fill out an appearance request card. For those of you in your first city council meeting, we have different types of appearance request cards for general appearance or on any hearing you can speak, but we generally get your information, but you can fill it out afterwards. So go ahead and give me your name and your address. Um, I'm Danielle Vieira Serrano. I live on 1619 Don San George Court, Orlando, Florida, 32812. That's actually in Jim Gray's district. I wanted to know where you stand on the issue because you haven't spoken. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Generally, the rules are you have to go through the chair and not engage with any I'm sorry, single I'm member, not. but I think Commissioner Gray probably wants to respond. Yeah, no, anyway. no, that's a, that's a fair request. I think a lot of the issues that have been brought up today are, are valid and are of concern, but the overriding issue for me is one of the, the core complaints I hear about 
uh, one of the things we fight all the time is neighbors that get to know each other and protect and look out for each other. Mm -hmm. As the police officers will tell you, they don't know who belongs there all the time because they're covering a specific area. So for me, by having a requirement, as long as we can enforce it, that we have a host there, they know who mm -hmm. belongs there. And right now in the the, the uh, B and B world, people show up legitimate, but their neighbors up and down the street don't know who they are, don't know how long they're going to be there. So I like the notion of having the owner um, are there so that they know who's supposed to be there. So when we have issues, uh, we can identify Somebody that. So that's the overriding issue for me is protecting neighborhoods, and you can't do it if you just have rentals coming and going. Hope that helps. That helps me, and I guess my testimony is I'm a I'm a new homeowner, I'm a veteran. Um, I'm younger, I'm younger in the community. I'm probably the youngest person on my street. And um, I think that would be helpful, you know, as somebody that has a more expensive mortgage than maybe some other people on the street, um, it would be helpful to be able to rent out a room temporarily and have short-term rentals for that supplemental income for my husband and I. Mm -hmm. I think for like some of the younger millennials in the community that are coming into home ownership that it would be helpful. Um, because it's going to happen either way. The street that I live on, there's no HOA, and there's somebody on my corner that he, <laughs> he's doing all types of stuff in there. He's running electricity from little, um, he has a shed that he's running electricity to and from. He's renting that out to certain people, and we don't know who those people are, and I feel like if there was some regulation while still allowing commerce, that would be helpful. Perfect. Well, thanks for coming. Because it's going to, to help. Share that. That's going to happen. You. you can't stop. Of the, I'm addressing you, um, Commissioner uh -oh. Ortiz. You can't stop the future. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I hate to be. I, I'm sorry to be so blunt, but may, this may is I, what's May I answer to that? <laughs> sure, Commissioner. Uh, and you're right. You're right. And I'm very well aware of that. But to me, my community safety is first. And, I and I'm going to protect our communities as much as I can. You just you just mentioned a house in the corner. Has anybody done anything about it? I don't know. <laughs> I work a lot. I'm just trying to pay my mortgage. My point. So you still, you still see those things. So I know that we have a great police department. We have great code enforcement officers. But we just can be everywhere all the time. And, uh, and, and I just I like to be proactive instead of reactive. That's how I see and it. I, I can respond and I like my community. And I, and I think everybody loves their community. I want to make sure that there's no threats to our communities. And I think this is something that has to be taken. If I, if I was king for a day, I would have done a, a referendum. Because I think this is something where the community have to have a say. And, and sometimes this goes, I know people don't hear about it. People don't know that this is being seen here at city council or whatnot, so they don't come out. So it's one of those things. You know, different approaches. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, uh, <laughs> I'm not out of this world. I understand where, where our community, I mean, where um, the times, and I understand where the society is heading. But uh, at the same time, I, it's my duty to protect our community as much, and our family, you know. This is our family as much as we can. And I understand that and as somebody who's had family that's been affected by the crisis, the financial crisis in Puerto Rico, on top mm -hmm. of the hurricane in Puerto Rico, like, I feel like this would be helpful. Uh, it's a good, I think it's a good middle ground to have some regulation while allowing those people to come here and not have to pay exorbitant hotel prices. And a lot of the people that are coming from Puerto Rico can't afford the rent here in a decent area. So I think that that gives them a good well, start. Well, well, people that are coming here, unless they're on vacation, uh, they're not going to come over to move over here and move to one of these places because this is short-term rentals. So uh, that, that doesn't really apply to that. It gives them a good start while they're looking for places, you know, somewhere more affordable. <laughs> good luck. You're not going to win, Commissioner. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. Wow, an unpaid lobbyist. <laughs> yeah, Kelly Gabra. <laughs> good luck with that. Are you thank one you. of the Valencia students? Yes, I am. Okay, well, thank you for being here. Thank you. Cool. Hey, Jason, I have one more question. How many... Uh, Airbnb or other platform homes do we estimate we have in Orlando? It's between 1,200 and 2,000. Um, so Commissioner Ortiz, they're here. The <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to keep track of every crime that happens in one of these Airbnbs. I'll be the worst nightmare when it comes to that. And, and mind you, when we do do the um, more proactive enforcement scheme, it, it, they monitor several websites, not just Airbnb. It's VRBO. It's, it's FlipKey. It's each one of those. And they take weekly screenshots, which 
if they're posting it without the registration and without the proper permit, if you will, that can in and of itself be a code enforcement violation of the scheme, and that's how other communities have gotten a better handle on this. Mayor, if I may say, it's a nightmare right now to enforce code enforcement. It's a nightmare. We don't have enough personnel. It's, it's an issue we have in the city. I mean, it's, it's, there's so many things. I mean, I can go on and, and go through neighborhoods and, and find all kinds of violations going on right now, and we're not taking care of those. So we're just adding to the pile. Okay, Commissioner Stewart. Um, Jason, one of the issues that we we took, you and I talked about was immediate enforcement, um, similar to what we did with the red light uh, running cameras, that we determine a fine, that fine begins to, um, uh, is, uh, uh, begins right away, I guess, if you want to call it that, uh, in such a way that, that we don't <coughs> overtax our existing code enforcement board by bringing hundreds of these every week. And that, much like the red light enforcement, um, uh, we're moving it very quickly on it. But what ch kind of challenge I have is that well, this is an Uber problem. Um, and, and the question is, I don't know if we answered the question today, but how many Uber vehicles have been actually um, uh, registered inside the city limits, and yet they still run? Um, and uh, um, so we have to figure out where is that sweet spot that gives us enough enforcement um, in an area where we can, that we won't get preempted by the state of Florida. Doing nothing means we now get preempted by the state of Florida and the next thing that happens is that uh, all the issues that we just addressed with, with uh, that uh, Commissioner Ortiz wants to address, we have no solution to except to hire more people. Um, so here we have a chance, I think, don't we, to do a faster enforcement of this issue? Correct. So the way that we've set it up under the ordinance and the implementation that we're imagining is that it could be a general code violation, like a traffic ticket, if you would, if you're caught advertising a holding out and it's in the ordinance. If you hold out that online rental, that could be a code violation that could be punishable by an immediate, like, it's like a traffic ticket, a general code violation, rather than taking you through the process with the code enforcement board. Um, and of course, if, if we were to hire a third party to monitor that for us and take the proof of the website on all the different platforms, which is what the proposal is as we implement it over the next few months, um, we can have more proactive enforcement and fines. And that's, that's how the Denver's and Los Angeles's and Chicago's have gotten more of a handle on the situation for this and what most of the other cities are going towards in order to, um, in, in other words, we're, we're trying to accommodate the sharing economy, you know, not necessarily prohibiting it. It's a little bit different take than what we, what we did with Uber, but we're using the same types of tools that the sharing economy would use to set, set the enforcement scheme. Further discussion, hearing none, all in favor of the motion. Mayor, we have two more public comments. <coughs> okay. We have uh, more people right that would like to testify, but whoever turned this one in, I can't read. Cheryl, maybe? Cheryl Belfay. <laughs> Cheryl Belfay. Cheryl Belfay. Yep. Sorry, nobody can ever read my handwriting. Sorry about that. Hi, I'm Cheryl Belfay, and I live at 222 East Concord, which is in the Eola Heights district that Patty so wonderfully represents. First of all, Jason, thank you for the very comprehensive pros and cons. It was very informative. As a homeowner who has extra bedrooms and also has an apartment, it, is, it would be very beneficial to us to help offset, quite frankly, our thousands of dollars of taxes to be able to have the revenue and we do live there so it would also mean that we would oversee anyone that was in the apartment. I also to Mr. Ortiz's comment about if we change it you're going to have more issues. I would venture to say that the same people that are going to cause the issues are probably not going to, it's not going to matter whether it's legal for them to have it or not. They're going to do what they're going to do. One of the things I'm also curious as a citizen, how can I find out, I just found out thanks to our neighborhood information, they sent out an e-blast about the hearing today, 
how can we be more informed? How can we be more involved to find out about what's being proposed? I have a lot of questions. For example, I believe there is an ordinance that we would be grandfathered in that does not allow my particular Lake Eola Heights neighborhood to do short term less than 30 days. I don't know if that's going to be one of the things that's a question. Would the new ordinance change that? Would it, that still be prohibited? I guess I'm not sure how it affects our neighborhood. And I'm wondering, are there public meetings that we can attend to find out more? Or do, how does the, I know that you're having another hearing in February. What opportunities do I have to have my wishes heard between now and then? Obviously, I can email Patty. She's always wonderful about responding. But what are the? I That's don't know what the. That's probably the best way. Commissioner Sheehan said she's been out in the neighborhoods trying to contact, I guess, the neighborhood association leadership um, mm -hmm. to get input, which she gave today. So input through your district commissioner is probably the best way to do it. But will there be other meetings or committees or any kind of processes between now and the February commission meeting? Jason, you hold any meetings? Um, Mr. Mayor, that's already went to the Municipal mm -hmm. Planning Board, well, which was the fair. hearing for that. Certainly, in my presentation, I described the education campaign that n is necessary, and the City of Denver is kind of the model on which to do it. They have an entire marketing scheme, get legit Denver, you know, and, and things like that. Those are the types of things that we would be doing in order to, to implement this in the city so our citizens understand what could happen. And certainly this ordinance is citywide, so it would be affecting all of the residential zoning districts as an accessory unit. So it would be allowed potentially in Lake Yellow Heights. So if you wanted to do that, you potentially could. And I think I understand, Jason, that the industry, various platforms are supportive of this ordinance? There are different opinions throughout the entire industry depending on who we, we, we talk with, if you will. Um, for example, the lobbying organization for short-term rentals, and there's different aspects. There's vacation rentals, there's short-term rentals. It's a very different cornucopia of different interests that are, are involved. We've had some direct talks with Airbnb they're supportive of, of liberalizing our rules, for lack of a better term, but still having a way of, of having an enforcement mechanism. They prefer to have success with um, different cities throughout all of Florida, and they've, they've talked with us. They've had different successes throughout the state, whether it's Flagler or Miami Beach, and they've had different problems there. We've come up, I think, with a happy medium for that industry. But there are some lobbying organizations, especially for the, the vacation rental industry, that would prefer no regulation whatsoever. Those are the types of vacation rentals that you'll find down in Polk County where the entire unit is being leased out. It's a less of an Airbnb type of use and more of a, you have an entire subdivision of vacation rentals, which we tend not to have here in Orlando. Okay. Mayor, if I may. Um, Jason, I signed up for a class, unfortunately, before I found out what the Lake Eola Heights Historic Neighborhood Association, um, you know, when they were having their meetings, unfortunately. I did call David, and that's why you got the email blast. But is there any way, perhaps, since I can't go to the next meeting, I hate to do this to you, but could you go to the next Lake Eola Heights Historic Neighborhood Association meeting for me or if have somebody If there? it's before the next hearing, certainly yeah, it would be I'm February more than willing 8th, to go. I believe, is, is I, when it's at. I'm yeah. I might be out of town okay. for February 8th, but we would certainly have somebody there. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have one more uh, card. Antoinette Monroe. Hi, I'm Antoinette Monroe. My address is 3921 Ibis Drive, Orlando, Florida, 32803. I live in Audubon Park. I, too, am a new homeowner. Um, and I'm for short-term short vacation rentals. I appreciate knowing that the investment that I made in purchasing a home affords me the opportunity to supplement my income should something happen like I lose my job or um, there's a medical expense or something unplanned. I know that I've made an investment that I can leverage to kind of improve whatever situation I find myself in. Um, a part of why I chose that neighborhood is also because it does not have an HOA, which allows me the flexibility to use the property that I pay for the way it best fits my family. So 
Um, I'm not for the additional restrictions because my neighbors may not understand it or may not have used it and might not be familiar and therefore are apprehensive. Um, restricting my opportunities uh, to leverage the investment that I've made in the best way that fits my family. I also don't necessarily think that having the homeowner have to live on site or be present during a reservation is necessary because for some, the only opportunity you may have to make those few extra dollars might be when you're away on vacation. And being able to rent out your property to pay for that vacation might be the only way you might be able to take a vacation. So as long as it's a primary residence, uh, I feel comfortable knowing that as a homeowner, I'm gonna take care of my primary residence. I'm gonna be mindful about who I let uh, visit or rent short term and also what I allow to happen there because I have to return and live in my home. Uh, whereas having to be present to rent it out might be difficult if I have other things that I need to do, if I have to travel for work or do those things. So the lip being on site during a reservation, I see a bit restrictive and would be unnecessary if it's someone's primary home because we we care about the home that we live in and have to return to. Okay, thank you, Mr. Stewart. Uh, Antoinette, if you if you don't mind, can I ask you a quick question? Because you now you're in my district, and I want to ask this question. I understand all the things you've said, and <clears throat> frankly, I'm not sure I agree with all of them. That's okay because that's part of this challenge that we have. We're all trying to address. Would it change your mind if we told you it could cost you as much as 500 to 1000 dollars to sign up to so you could do this? No, it would not because if I'm renting my property for 100 dollars a night, I have the opportunity to make, you know, 3000 dollars in a month. So, I'll pay that 500 dollars fine to be able to have the opportunity to make three times as much. Yeah, I guess I'm I, I guess I'm looking at those we've heard the same complaints from people who have said I've lost my job and now I can go rent my house. But if there's an an investment and a date and time delay to handle inspection, they tend to backtrack and say, well, no, you can't, you can't do that. So if, the, if somebody's looking to do it as a supplemental business, which is, we, we got some strict restrictions for that, but oftentimes it seems that when they get into a uh, particular uh, dire straits where they need something, an income for three or four months while they're looking, uh, they may not actually be part of this. Uh, and when and if they get caught, now they're caught at being fined $100 a day and they haven't got a job. Right. So having a $500 fine makes it more difficult. It's Should not a fine. I have it's to a, it's not the $100 is a fine. To it's sign $500 up to sign up. Pay the, pay the additional insurance required and pay all those other things it takes you to, to become part of, the, of right. this plan. Well, I looked at, I, I'm looking at it from a proactive standpoint, whereas knowing that I want to have this backup plan or this safety cushion, I'm going to save and, and make that investment because I'm planning for the future. Um, if I'm already in that situation, yes, having to pay that fee makes it a lot harder. Um, but I think about it from a business standpoint. If, if I know that there's a possibility that something could befall that's negative, I'm willing to make the investment to uh, prepare for my future just like you would contribute a portion of your income to your 401k for just in case or you have an HSA plan for just in case something happens. Um, so that's how I look at it. If it's $500, absolutely I'm willing to make that investment so that I can secure an opportunity for me to provide for myself regardless of what may happen unplanned. Okay. Thank you, Antoinette. Thank Good you, Mayor. Job. Thank you. Any further discussion? Can can I ask one last question, Mayor? I know that you're, you're tired. Are you voting no anyways? <laughs> <laughs> I got one question, and I appreciate what you just said because you made my case. Um, how you feel about your neighbors not liking that? I like my neighbors a lot. I'm on next door all the time. I communicate with them frequently. No. If my neighbors disagree, uh -huh. I would appreciate the opportunity to express my point of view. Mm -hmm. Most of my neighbors who do not agree are extremely vocal on next door, and they've never used Airbnb. They don't understand the concept, so it's different for them. However, I might have a neighbor in my neighborhood who has used Airbnb to have a place for their family to come and visit them and be nearby because we don't have hotels immediately in the area. But my question is, will you value their opinion in terms of maintaining that business of yours? I would value their opinion and I would respectfully disagree. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Madam Clerk, uh, I think I got a little ahead of ourselves <laughs> since um, 
none of our commissioners, nor myself, realized I didn't have you read the title of the oh, ordinance. Wow, okay. Could you do that? Ordinance 2018-3, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, relating to owner-occupied home sharing, amending Chapter 58, Part 5B, Land Development Code, modifying the bed and breakfast standards and providing regulations for owner-occupied home sharing, amending Chapter 66, Part 2, Land Development Code, to provide a definition of owner-occupied home sharing, amending Chapter 5, Orlando City Code, to provide for civil penalties, providing legislative findings and for severability, codification, correction of Scrivener's errors, and an effective date. Who made the motion and second? So move in. And a second. Okay, why don't you make them again since oh, we yeah, didn't have the. Oh, moved and I second, I think. Okay. Okay, yeah. I'll vote Hill, I'll Sheehan. Move. Okay, <laughs> motion by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Sheehan. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 As opposed, the motion carries. No. <laughs> hey. 6 1, Commissioner Ortiz <laughs> voting no. Right? Okay. Hearings, ordinance is second reading, number one, Madam Clerk. Uh, hey, Mayor, do you want to hold Oh, yeah, this? yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's not with it today. Okay, this is a proposed ordinance that by Florida statute requires two public hearings, one of which must be held after 5 o'clock unless there's a majority plus one vote to hold the second hearing at our normal time of 2 o'clock. I'd like to entertain a motion that the second public hearing on this ordinance be held at the next regularly scheduled council meeting, which is February 12, 2018, as Jason mentioned before, instead of waiting for the next 501 scheduled council meeting. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Ng, second by Commissioner Sheehan. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries with a majority plus one. Okay, could you, let's move to hearings ordinance of second reading number one. Ordinance 2018-1, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, amending the city's growth management plan to change the future land use map designation for certain land generally located south of Rugby Street, west of Ann Arbor Avenue, and east of Edgewater Drive, comprised of 0.21 acres of land, more or less, from residential low intensity to office low intensity, changing the property zoning designation from 1-2 family residential zoning district with the traditional city, Wakaiva specially planned area, and appearance review overlay districts to office and residential zoning district with the traditional city city, Wakaiva specially planned area and appearance review overlay districts, providing for amendment of the city's official future land use and zoning maps, providing for severability, correction of scrivener's errors, permit disclaimer, and an effective date. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Stewart, second by Commissioner Ortiz. Commissioner Stewart. Let me tell you a quick thank you to um, um, Dr. Valle and his family. Uh, we are still working through uh, some of the challenges um, in terms of uh, that area, but I appreciate how open you have been to helping us kind of get through this process. Uh, um, the best part is I know it's your long-term investment, um, and so we want to make sure we do it right for you and for everybody in the community. So I want to say a personal thank you uh, for how flexible you've been and, and working with our uh, staff. So thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public that would like to testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 As opposed, motion carries. Number two, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2018-4, an ordinance of the City of Orlando, Florida, relating to the Florida Building Code, amending Article 1, Chapter 13, Orlando City Code, to adopt the Florida Building Code, 6th edition, 2017, providing local administrative amendments to the Florida Building Code and ultimate design, wind speeds for buildings and other structures within the city, providing for transmittal to the Florida Building Commission, severability, codification, correction of Scrivener's errors, and an effective date. So moved. Second. Second. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Ings. Is there anyone from the public that would like to testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners hearing none. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Number three, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2017-74, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, relating to roadway design and access management, amending Chapter 61, Part 2B, Orlando City Code, to update the major thoroughfare plan, providing legislative findings and for severability, codification, correction of Scrivener's errors, and an effective date. So moved. Second. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Ings. Is there anyone from the public that would like to testify? Discussion among commissioners hearing none. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 As opposed, motion carries. All right, ordinances on first reading number one. Ordinance 2018-7, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, relating to signs, amending Chapter 64, Orlando City Code, to clarify the standards for signage on regional facilities, providing legislative findings and for severability, codification, correction of Scrivener's errors, and an effective date. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Ings, second by Commissioner Hill. Is there anyone from the public that would like to 
testify. Discussion among commissioners hearing none. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Number two, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2018-5, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, relating to a street name change, renaming Weller Boulevard, generally located west of Nercusi Road between Valencia College and Lake Nona High School, to Nemours Parkway, directing amendments to the official maps of the City of Orlando, Florida, providing for severability, crushed on Scrivener's errors, and an effective date. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gray, second by Commissioner Ortiz. Did you know the Wellers very well? I did not, sir. Okay. Changing all those names out there. <laughs> no, what, Mr. and Mrs. have not called me yet, so I guess they're okay. <laughs> uh, are the Wellers present? No. We're just kidding. We're changing <laughs> a name that was just placed on one of the streets in the medical city to Nemours <laughs> Parkway, which is certainly appropriate. Um, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Number three, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2018-6, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, relating to a street name change, renaming Hartwell Court, generally located south of Laureate Boulevard and east of the Lake Nona VA Hospital to Centerline Drive, directing amendments to the official maps of the City of Orlando, Florida, providing for severability, correction of Scrivener's errors, and an effective date. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gray, second by Commissioner Ortiz. Is there anyone from the public that would like to testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners, hearing none, all in favor. The motion indicates so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Number four, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2018-8, an ordinance of the City Council of City of Orlando, Florida, amending the city's growth management plan to change the future land use map designation for certain land generally located south of East Colonial Drive, east of North Magnolia Avenue, north of Hillcrest Street, and west of Irma Avenue, comprised of 1.42 acres of land, more or less from office high intensity to downtown activity center, creating sub-area policy S.14.18 to encompass the subject property, providing for amendment of the city's future land use maps, providing for severability, correction of Scrivener's errors, and an effective date. So moved. Second. Second. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Stewart. Is there anyone from the public that would like to testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners. Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, so the motion carries. And that concludes the official business of the Orlando City Council for today. No request for general appearance, so that will conclude our meeting. Thank you. I want to help you.